I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Graham Huon, and I'm the chair here in Melbourne for the AES uh, in Melbourne section. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a bit of a trip through the audio chain from probably from start to finish of the reproduction chain. The end-to-end -end surround reproduction chain has always had difficulties with loudspeaker placement and aiming, listener sweet spot restrictions and effectiveness of listener envelopment with listener immersion. Attempts to improve the listener experience have resulted in new recording and playback formats that have offered some degree of improvement, but were often incompatible with existing equi equipment. Tonight, Charles Van Dongen, Charlie, of Involve Audio based in Melbourne, Australia, will talk about the end-to-end -end sound reproduction chain extending from the latest generation of loudspeaker transducers through amplifiers and render electronics that have been developed based on just how humans perceive sound. This work includes development of a range of modern electrostatic loudspeakers with matching electronics and amplifiers and new multi-channel multi render technologies that overcome many weaknesses yet remain compatible with the many surround formats available today. Now, about Charlie, who on my screen is right in the middle. So, uh, yep, there he is. Charlie is Director and Chief Technical Officer at the audio design and manufacturing company Involve Audio, based in Mentone, Melbourne, Australia. He received his technical training from Swinburne University of Technology and has had a long career in audio innovation, including companies such as VAS, ER Audio, Immersion and Winnovate. Charlie holds numerous patents and unique design innovations. I am looking forward to hearing tonight's presentation because there's a lot of new stuff in this and I hope that you all enjoy it too. So by whatever means you do it, can you please welcome Charlie to the AES Melbourne? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a little quick um, prehistory of it all. I've always been a, a sound nut from a very young age, probably from 13 or 14 years old, uh, introduced to various um, uh, technology, coming, having a very poor background. I, I've invariably built everything, turntables, you name it, amplifiers, I'd build it. Um, and I'd, uh, at one stage I became fascinated that um, uh, I couldn't afford speakers at that time and so I was listening on headphones and I was listening to one particular passage of Rick Wakeman's Journey to the Centre of the Earth on headphones and by God, the guitar went behind my head and I said, how the hell did that happen? And that started me on a bit of a, uh, a direction, shall we say, for many years, um, just thinking about that and not having a degree at the time, it, it, uh, it puzzled me and then of course, surround sound came out, which was in the um, in the in the uh, in the seventies. Uh, I was probably one of the first to try to the Hefner Dynaco left minus right subtract, which I kind of liked. Um, but again, uh, couldn't afford a set of speakers, so it didn't really happen. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, I was quite amused during the. Um, the 70s with the surround sound experience then. Uh, there were so many competing systems. There was uh, SQ, QS, RM, CD4, Ambisonics. Um, I could go on, it just doesn't hit my head right now which ones that there are, but some of them were compatible, some were just not compatible. Um, what caused the death of surround sound was many things back then. Uh, I think probably the prime thing was uh, confusion, uh, market confusion towards the 80s. Uh, there were too many cross-competing systems, uh, not always compatible really with stereo, uh, which I think uh, in retrospect has always been a major issue to make sure that everything is fully frontwards and backwards and sideways compatible. And uh, what's I think not fully understood these days and all the promotion of surround sound is that um, uh, even today, the most popular format around the world is really still stereo because you look, there's YouTube, there's radio, there's TV, there's uh, Foxtel and um, all the other things which uh, I can't think of right now and all the, uh, the download stuff. It, it really is a, a, a stereo world and we walk around with our iPods um, which is really stereo. And so it's still the most um, adopted format. 
we tend to listen to surround when we're doing mu um, movies in our home cinemas, if they still exist these days. Um, uh, and uh, I think um, that's uh, it's, it's been talked about as a, a great uh, the, 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 the going thing, but in real market terms, I don't think it has been. I remember uh, there was a survey done by Philips somewhere in the 90s where they looked um, where the, um, uh, when they sold their 5.1 systems, what happened to them? And they found it in 60% of cases, people uh, connected their surround systems. Um, uh, well, they either didn't, did, they didn't even didn't, uh, didn't connect the rear speakers or they put the rear speakers up front. Um, it was just uh, confusion. Uh, and, uh, and also you have the situation where um, if the center channel uh, came in around about 1986 with the advent of Dolby. Um, Dolby, as, as, as you guys would no doubt know, originally came on the scene in the, um, in the 70s with uh, cassette deck noise reduction, and that was their real thing. Uh, come the 1980s with the advent of CDs, uh, that really died. Uh, cassettes died a, died a, a death. I still like them, but I'm weird. Um, and in 1986 or 85, I think 86, they released ProLogic 1, but more importantly released the, the concept of the center channel. And the center channel to a degree got around one of the other big problems of surround sound in the, uh, in the 70s. And that was with the four channel systems back then, um, there was really only one position in the room to sit. If you sat left or right, um, the whole presentation, the, the central uh, performer and everything would swing to the, the left-hand side if you sat to the left or, and right. so it was really a one person experience, not a family experience. So the adoption of the center channel uh, had the effect of to, to centralize the, um, the, the vocalist. Uh, uh, I, in 1986, uh, true to my usual uh, performance. I uh, built my first Dolby Pro Logic unit um, with great enthusiasm and uh, turned it on and uh, was very, very disappointed. Uh, it was, to me, a, a total mess. Um, didn't sound at all like reality. And it also, to me, put the, um, the centre vocalist underneath the television, not um, centralised. So there was this, always this 30 degree differential between the two which really threw me. And uh, um, so I then basically got rid of it and went back to stereo for many, many years. Uh, um, in fact, until uh, 2007 or eight, uh, I think 2008, uh, when I got back into surround. Uh, so in the meantime, I was of course an engineer um, working on power systems, would you believe? Switch mode power supplies. Um, I did both electrical and electronic engineers, so I've been in both fields. I'd have a manufacturing company in the mid 90s, which we would make all sorts of stuff, uh, optical stuff, um, alarm stuff, protection stuff, um, stuff in general. Um, for other companies, we and we'd be making uh, 20,000 circuit boards for the Holden Commodore every, every week at one stage. That's a nice way to go broke. Um, and somewhere in the mid nineties, I was on a holiday and uh, I was thinking about the coming death of the electronics industry. Uh, Cause in my mind, uh, I felt the, uh, the electronics industry was too dependent on the whole communication sector at the time and was um, due to uh, roll over and die. And so I, uh, we, we had a, a manufacturing company uh, where we uh, would both do designs for other people, but also manufacture circuit boards, which was Vassal Electronics. And um, I felt that uh, the industry was gonna be very sick. And uh, in, as it turns out, I was pretty right around about the year 2000. Uh, uh, communications totally pulled out of this country. Ericsson, Fujitsu, uh, Siemens, uh, you name it, they basically did a walkie and uh, uh, the electronics industry took a major dive. And so but what I was uh, looking at was a new direction for our company. 
and uh, I came across, uh, this may seem a bit of a wandering path, I came across, uh, I was, I was fun, thumbing through articles, I think, in Electronics Today magazine, remember that? Uh, there was all, a whole bunch of magazines back then, um, Electronics Australia, Electronics Today, Australian Electronics Monthly, there's a few others there which I've no doubt forgot. Um, and I was looking for inspiration and I saw a very interesting article um, by uh, a guy called Rob McKinlay in West Australia from ER Audio and he made kit electrostatic loudspeakers and I looked at it and I thought this is really interesting. He's done a great job, um, solved a lot of problems and uh, was uh, I think on a very good path. And um, I uh, puzzled over this for a while. Um, because I also had a bit of a, uh, as a kid, if you remember, I said I had headphones. Well, they happened to be Stax electrostatic headphones. Um, and uh, uh, so I've had quite an electrostatic path. I had Stax electrostatics, I had mi uh, micro electrostatics, and then, then after that, more Stax electrostatics. So I had a lot of headphones. So I became very adapted to the electrostatic sound. Um, so I got to talking to Rob McKinley in West Australia, uh, who's a great guy. and um we decided well it's we better have a meeting together and uh uh so we, in talking to rob he's in west australia i'm in, I'm in melbourne and uh i said to rob how, how are we going to recognize each, each other and uh, rob said he's big and ugly i said well i'm big and ugly and so we decided to meet each other at uh Tullamarine airport and we went with big and ugly and sure enough uh come the day I was at the airport and uh, I look across the distance. I see Rob, he sees me. I said, good day. Uh, Big and Ugly worked very well uh, on the occasion. And uh, so um, we then built up one of his um, kit electrostatic speakers at my place here in Frankston. And uh, it was, um, how do I express it? It, uh, uh, it was huge, very big. Um, very quiet, not a lot of bass, not a lot of output, very insensitive, highly directional. And I'm talking about plus and minus an inch or so either way and the, the image would go whoops. Um, very fiddly. You needed an amplifier, you could kickstart a jumbo jet with. And uh, now probably sold you on electrostatics and listening to that, but um, Having said for that, I've heard stuff that I, I could never heard before. The, the, the detail, the clarity. Uh, Charlie, was it was it a flat panel or a curve? Uh, was it, uh, that was a, a free, um, free, free panels, a central treble strip. Uh, well, not, not yeah. really the treble, a central strip, broadband uh, central strip, thirty-five millimeters yes. on each, either side. I can't remember. Was about one hundred and ninety either side. But it actually did have a useful bass response to probably about 60 years, but very insensitive. Um, yes. but, but in the sweet spot, my God, uh, the imaging, the precision was extraordinary. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. I've yeah. never heard anything like Probably. it in my life. Uh, it, and uh, so it had all these negatives, but it had this glorious positive. And I, I made a decision on the spot with, with Rob. I said, Rob, you know, it's as if you're talking about a set of quads. It sounds like yeah. a quad. Yeah, it was very much um, it was very much of the quad fifty seven ilk, not the not the sixty yes. threes. The sixty threes always felt sounded like crap. The image, uh, the um, yeah. it was very flat. Uh, I've got stories on the sixty three if you want later on, but um, yeah. and so I, in my stupidity, decided. Well, in my arrogance, I decided. Well, give me about uh, a year or two, and I'm sure I can uh, do a lot with this technology with Rob and. Uh, and uh, go in production and make some, uh, I was looking for um, uh, value added product, if you will, not, not just making other people's stuff, uh, which is always a cutthroat industry. We were looking at value added and I felt this was value added and was unusual. And uh, I like doing stuff that's different. I mean, if you've got a bunch of salesmen in a room wearing gray suit some of the guy walked in the room with a yellow suit i like to stick out a bit and i like to have a product that's different and this to me was a direction that i liked and it tied in with my audio background and i felt it offers something but 
uh, my stupidity, I thought it would only take me a few years. Well, I'm still at it. And that, and that was in the mid nineties. And with uh, Rob and myself, um, Rob's a, a shareholder in Involve Audio. Uh, uh, I'm not a shareholder in his company, but I recommend you go to his website any day of the week, ER Audio. It's got some of our old prototypes all over there. And um, Rob um, is a mechanical engineer. Um, and we always joke that he knows more about the electronic side. No more, I know more about the mechanical side. So <laughs> but, uh, it's actually not true, but uh, he's a very, very clever guy and a good guy. Um, uh, and so over the years, we've been developing sometimes together, sometimes in parallel. Sometimes we've come up with a design which were, which were absolutely mirror identical, and even though we went separately on it. And so it's kind of been interesting over the years. Um, uh, and so we embarked in the process of electrostatic development. We, we, we built some big speakers. I mean, one was a five-way electrostatic uh, plus um, it was a hybrid dual 12 inch bass it was really a big monstrous thing still i think one of the best sounding speakers i ever had don't ask me where it is right now it got uh it's been disappeared in liquidation somewhere um but um we developed many speakers the tallest of which was seven foot three um which was an interesting uh speaker um but always um the issues of Electrostatic speaker development is a very difficult subject. It's got so many variables. Um, uh, you've, you've got, if you vary one thing, if you vary, for example, just off the top of my head, gap separation, straight away that changes um, uh, the maximum SPL, it changes the sensitivity, uh, it means you've got to um, vary the tension, most likely, you've got to vary the EHT. Everything varies on you, and um, there are so many interacting parameters on on it. So one thing affects everything else. Uh, there are some rules of thumb in electrostatic speaker design, um, which you can go by to a degree. Uh, but and I'm sure if I had the time, I could probably condense a lot of this in terms of an Excel spreadsheet, um, uh, because it is fairly predictable in most areas. Um, but it's enormous interactions. And so various things I've discovered along the way, um, but um, just to elaborate a little bit further, I'll, I might just uh, go to a screen share for a sec to, to, to show you some pictures um, here. Um, hoping you, you all got that. Um, can you see a... Um, uh, a PowerPoint? Yep, <laughs> yep, yeah. we're seeing that. Okay. Um, and on the PowerPoint there, you, you're probably seeing uh, to the right there um, a set of speakers in black. Um, well, that was one that we did for Nakamishi in, uh, in 2007. Um, uh, it was a hybrid, uh, dual eight inch cones in bottom end, very novel base design. Um, and a freeway electrostatic up top, dual 100 watt uh, class AB amplifiers in there in each speaker. Um, the experience was interesting because we uh, was actually the relaunch of the, 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 the product, the Dragon for the electric, for, for um, the Nakamishi, uh, um, 25 years of um, uh, anniversary of the Dragon cassette deck was a relaunch of the brand. 2007 but unfortunately during the relaunch their parent company which is the Grandy Group in um, in Singapore had a 600 million dollar loss um, that then reflected on us uh, we had a very very dumb CEO who was the son of the biggest shareholder uh, who had a very bad pricing policy the product was essentially scrapped uh, I got left with uh, 200 of the units which um, we made in a, in a factory in China, which we, we um, no, sorry, we got 140 of them, 200 made. Uh, we sold uh, all 140, um, but they're a very, very good speaker. Um, I've actually got two sets here at home. Um, but um, the interesting thing of them is that 
they weren't um muhammad you asked before the the, um, the array structure um i'll just go back to um my screen can i ask you something off topic I just, yeah. i'm afraid that i would have to run away at certain moment go for it what what if, if if you go back in time would you go planner ribbon or you will still uh, go electrostatic electrostatic for sure can uh, you tell me why quickly uh main reason is um the thinness of the um the, the thinness of the diaphragm uh the, 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 the um uh uniformity of the uh actual surface um the mylar we're using right now is 3.5 microns thick uh yeah. the conduct the conductive coating is nothing if you weighed six millimeters of air that's how much the diaphragm weighs um cool. You know, so it's for these reasons. But the limitations of uh, of the electrostatic are many, like sensitivity. But clearly, the um, magnetic approach. But is... I, I think they're both very low in sensitivity. Like if you if you look at the magnet pants, yeah, you're talking eighty six dB. Yeah, but there are very loud uh, uh, magnetic versions out there in Australia. There's um... We're probably going to have to interrupt Charlie. We might have to hold the questions to the end. But thanks, Mohammed, for that. Okay. Okay. We've got I'm a lot sorry. to get okay, through. Go ahead. You've got That's a lot okay. to get through, and we're, uh, yep. we're about a quarter okay. of the way. So, okay. Okay. Um, so uh, keep it to the end, if that's okay, Mohammed. I know you won't be there. It's fine, it's fine. Can, of course, of course, of course. No, but you can type your questions, Mohammed, if you want. Uh, that's okay. I apologize. Uh, no, that's all good. Um, and so, the big difference between that Nakamishi Dragon speaker you saw a second ago, and for example, the, the Martin Logan, which have got curved arrays, uh, is, uh, well, in fact, the Nakamishi flat unit had much better dispersion than the, than the Martin Logan. I know because I had a set of Martin Logan summits here at home, and um, the dispersion was way better on the on the Nakamishi Dragon. And uh, Nakamishi, sorry, Logan have sold the concept of uh, a curved array that somehow a curved array uh, creates better dispersion. I can tell you right now it's false. Um, uh, you can't. Um, uh, mylar is a non-structural material, and so it, it always will behave in a pistonic way. It can't, can't for um, a curved surface to behave uniformly, it's got to expand. But if that material is non-flexible, non-expandable, non, non it doesn't, it, it has, it ends up causing um, non-linear forces forward and backwards. And so that limits the, in fact, it limits the frequency range that, uh, the uh, electrostatic can go for, and that's one of the reasons Logan have such a high crossover frequencies. Um, and so uh, the the general summation of where I'm going with this is, well, one more step, is that uh, in the, uh, after 2007, 2009, I should say, when I formed this new company, Involve Audio, uh, we had a lot of sales pressure to miniaturize the panels and it took me a long time to figure out how to shrink these huge electrostatic panels down to the, the new ones are about a foot tall. I think we saw it in that picture on the screen share. I'll just uh, go back to screen share for a second. You'll see that. Um, can you see that panel? I'm just circling my, uh, that's that's about a foot or so high. Um, and they're pretty loud. They're well over 100 dB. Um, and uh, we've now worked out techniques to either improve dispersion or make it worse. And, um, and there are reasons I make the dispersion worse, and I'll go into that a bit later. Um, but in general, the, the big thing of electrostatics after all these years is one word, it's called, called tolerance. Um, you've got to tie the mechanics down rock solid. Uh, you've, you've also got to work on your insulations. It's, it's very important. Interestingly enough, don't make the insulation too good because it can cause other problems. Um, but these things are critical to the whole electrostatic development process. Um, so uh, we've gone down a path, as I said now, that we can actually control dispersion. Uh, I'm about to release in the next few months a uh, uh, desktop size electrostatic sort of, uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, it uh, will have deliberately a very wide dispersion 
close to a normal cone speaker. Um, there's some patents we've worked out on that just recently. I can't reveal that tonight, what they are, because uh, it's still being finalised. But that's one of the directions we're moving towards. Now, um, along the way, uh, so if you just grab that, those thoughts on electrostatics, it's a very difficult path. Tolerance is critical. Mechanical tying it down is very critical. Um, but along the way, we then went into the topic of uh, very often we've observed that good loudspeakers can test badly and bad loudspeakers can test goodly. Um, we've all had the experience where we've tested a speaker for frequency response, THD, CSD, IMD, tone bursts, uh, whatever, and it's come out pretty good. And then you listen to the thing, it's not really that good at all. And uh, this puzzled us because we were in a, a development process at the time, also do, looking at cone speakers, which I'm not doing right now. Um, but it led us to some interesting conclusions. Um, and so this is where I get quite controversial and many people will probably disagree. Uh, but we managed to grab a whole bunch of different um, uh, speakers, myself and my design partner, David, um, uh, and of all different shapes, sizes, flavors, configurations. And some of them tested really good and didn't sound too good. And uh, we ended up doing a 73 or 75 page report where we tested everything on every speaker, and I'm, I mean everything, you know, polar responses, THDs, IMDs, frequency responses, you name it, we did it. And because we're pretty confident we'll be able to trap down just what defines a good sounding speaker. And to establish that, we, we one of our usual ways we work is we get panels of people. Um, and we just, we asked the question, which one do you prefer? And then why? Uh, so it's a case of listen to this speaker and, uh, and and why did you like it? Why didn't you like it? And we isolated it down to three interesting speakers. One was one of ours, which was an electrostatic. It was a 380 millimeter long electrostatic. Um, another one which tested really well, it was just a small uh, two-way box very low distortion, very good frequency response and all that sort of stuff, sounded like shit. Um, and another one, which was a little uh, concentric pod, which was probably about uh, two inches diameter, uh, was concentric. Uh, and so the base was uh, an external base to it. Um, tested really bad. I mean, the it was not not good testing at all, and uh, but the panel of people all liked it, including me. It sounded rather nice, and uh, when I say nice in terms of imaging, precision of image, uh, you close your eyes, it's there, and those sort of things. Um, I've always said with speakers, the the best test in many ways is, is if you sit there and close your eyes, if you can spot where the speaker, if you can. If you can hear where the speakers are, that's not a good speaker. If the speaker's uh, invisible to where you can perceive, that's starting to be a good speaker. Uh, so anyway, we got down to these three contenders, the one that tested well, the one that uh, tested badly, and uh, the electrostatic. And, uh, and, and uh, my, David and myself, I mean, we, we had one moment where we're both sitting cross-legged on the ground. We just couldn't work this out. There was no correlation in the results that we could spot. And so we started looking at things visually. What did we see with these speakers? And we saw some interesting things. One was the, the speaker that sounded great, but tested lousy. It was a little tiny concentric thing. So con concentric was an interesting concept. Uh, and then also we then looked at the polar response of this concentric. It was very good. Very broad polar response was virtually circular, which was strange. Um, whereas the um, the speaker that tested 
well that sounded crap. That was a, uh, a monopole. Uh, in other words, it's just frontwards firing, as, as 95%, 99% of speakers on the market are. That led us to the thought of let's construct some jigs and try this out. And we then constructed a more basic jig back then and later a much more advanced jig. Uh, where again, we got test monkeys, about 10, and asked them to tank the three speakers, our electrostatic. So sorry, that, that's that's wrong. Um, no, that was, that was a separate test we did. Um, we could configure the speaker in different modes. We could make it into a monopole, a dipole, or a bipole. Dipole, going that way, bipole, that firing. Uh, and we could also configure it to be concentric or non-concentric. And we've got a, I've got a picture of one, which I'll just fire to right now. Um, on the next page, I think there it is. Whoops, there it is. That thing there. This was still in my office these days, and that, that, they're the switches which where you can configure electrically it into different uh, patterns. And the result was very, very interesting. Again, uh, was, you know, it wasn't, uh, the voting wasn't close. Uh, the number one pick was the concentric dipole. Uh, nobody chose the monopole non-concentric configuration. Second favorite to the concentric dipole was the concentric bipole, which is a useful result. Um, and so we then asked the people, why? Why do you prefer it? And the results were pretty well the same. Some didn't know why, they just liked it. But the ones most did know why, and that was that to them it was a much bigger sound but also the clarity, the imaging, they could they could visually, sorry, from an audio point of view, see the object. So it was focus. Um, and that was most interesting. And uh, at that point, David, my design partner, and myself, we both concluded we were both idiots. And because for all these years, we've been doing electrostatic speakers, which were, which are concentric dipoles. I mean, the, on an electrostatic, it's, uh, they're concentric. Basically, the sounds uh, coming out of all positions on the diaphragm, uh, they're dipoles. And uh, what we found by using the concentric dipole trick, uh, uh, the sound of a normal cone speaker would suddenly, I wouldn't say be as good as the electrostatic, but certainly start to bridge that gap. It was quite astounding. Before these tests, I, I personally felt that the, the, the difference was going to be in the uh, the, uh, the CSD or the impulse decay response. Uh, I felt that would be the difference. And, and the electrostatics romp there. I mean, the electrostatics are 20 times faster than normal cones uh, in, in terms of their CSD decay response times. But uh, that's more icing on the cake. From our tests, the real big dramatic difference was the mechanical configuration of going to concentric dipoles. Now, uh, I have interest in a separate company that that technology they're, they're currently developing themselves, which is in that area of concentric dipole cones. Um, and I wish them well on that, but our own path is on electrostatics. So that was a bit of a divergence. And um, we then um, went into, um, well, the Nakamishi deal was dying because of their own financial problems. I knew we had to, to, to change paths. And so I started thinking about different uh, problems in audio. And the problem in audio that has always eluded me, and I think eluded pretty well everybody, is uh, the sweet spot. That uh, if you sit in the sweet spot, uh, it's lovely, but if you go an inch one way or an inch the other way, particularly with electrostatics, the sound image goes whoops. And unless you've experienced with electrostatics, which are really like torches, uh, the image just goes every which way very quickly. Um, I spent two years thinking about the problem, got nowhere. And midway on a bike ride between a bike crash and a phone call from a very stupid lawyer, the idea hit me out of the blue how to do it. And uh, it was very simple in the end. 
and we actually got a patent on it. And, and what it came down to was that uh, if you were pretty dumb like me, you might have felt that uh, the, the central image was more determined by loudness as in like a, a, a balance control where you change the balance from one side to the other, change it a few dB one side, the image wanders to one side and vice versa. Turns out that's quite wrong. Uh, it's right, but it's wrong. It's more determined by the time delay arrival as determined by the Haas curve. Um, by the physicist Haas, H-A-A-S, a fellow Dutchman who mangles vowels with two A's in there. And um, what it means is we're all frightened little bunnies. We've been, we've evolved to hear the first arrival of the sound to the extent of 12 dB dominance, meaning that if you hear a sound that's 12 dB quieter, uh, if it arrives first, you'll pick that as the, as the dominant direction, even though the louder sound is second. Um, and that's a really interesting thing. Again, I'll just default quickly to the share screen um, and pull that up for you guys. That's the house curve there, if you can see down there. And basically it says that anywhere between 0.8 of a millisecond to about 30 milliseconds, uh, that's where you perceive sound direction based on um, time arrival. Above 30 milliseconds, it's perceived as echo. Um, and off to the side here, if you can see it, me circling this area here, is a little grab from our patent. And uh, as um, Graham heard at our factory the other day, basically the trick is you fire, you, you, you create highly directional speakers. Uh, you deliberately make the speaker directional, not omnidirectional, as everybody previously had thought in terms of doing this. And so you create torch beams. In fact, we, as you can see here, we've got two panels. They're driven by separate amplifiers, amplifier A and amplifier B. The two panels, um, uh, we actually enhance the, um, the isolation between the two by, by, by a slab of plastic in, there, in, in our case. And the, the net result is that off axis, you've got a prime axis where the speaker is firing, but off axis, we get more than 12 dB attenuation on frequencies above 800 Hertz. And what we do, we fire the, in, the, the in, inside panels first and the outside panels second by a time delay. Time delay is determined by the shape and, shape and size of the room. Um, and the guts of it is that if you, for example, take the right hand listener over here, he will predominantly hear this internal panel. We delay that sound. Sorry, no, sorry, we fire that first. So that sound comes out here to this virtual speaker here where I'm moving my mouse. And then we fire the outside one and then both sounds arrive at his ear at the same time. He then perceives the, the image towards the center, vice versa on the other side in the middle, it all works out averaging out. Turns out that in a room, it, it balances out pretty well that uh, you end up not caring where the hell you sit. Uh, and you end up with this diagram, which you see to the right, which we call our God diagram. It's got this godly sort of pattern there. Um, and uh, the yellow area is the, where you perceive the image to be centralized. The green area where it moves off a little bit, and then you get to the blue and other areas where the image is off. Um, but the, the net guts of it is it, it broadens out enormously within the room where you can sit. Uh, there are higher systems of this that we've done. Uh, we actually did, did a Disney, well, no, the Technicolor Theatre in uh, California, which was, I think, a four-band system, which uh, you could sit virtually anywhere in a whole cinema, and the image was centralised. Um, and so that's what we used to call our total perspective system. These days we call it our sweet spot, technolo uh, sweet spot technology system. It does work. Um, the bigger the panels are, the better. Currently, we've got the demonstration systems that are tiny things, around about a foot high on our Wi-4 system. Um, but the bigger, the better. And, um, and then I'll just keep on the screen here for a minute. Again, we went to our test monkeys. And um, we asked the test monkeys in our group, this is a group of 11, 
uh, were asked if they could discern the difference between stereo and T, uh, T, uh, TSS, which is, um, uh, S, that, should, that should say SST, sorry, uh, that's a typo. I just saw it then. In the central position, six of the test monkeys said they could hear the difference, that there was a difference between stereo and SST. Five said they couldn't. Off center, in this case, the left seated position, uh, could they hear the difference? 11 said yes, nobody said no. So they all heard it. And then we went to preferences. So we've established they hear it different. What do you prefer? In the central position, four, four preferred stereo, two preferred sweet spot technology, five had no preference. So what we concluded, I, I was one of the ones who preferred stereo in that central group because um, I can hear the difference and it depends on the size. If, it, if it's bigger, it gets better. Um, off, off center, all, uh, sorry, 10 preferred sweet spot and one had no preference. When we checked that one person with no preference, it turns out that person was deaf in one ear or partially deaf in one ear. And so what we concluded from that is we had a system that uh, mimics the center channel that you didn't have to sit in the middle of the room anymore. And uh, we felt that was quite important. And we've now incorporated that into our Y4 surround system. And that to, to us solved a major problem of surround sound. That was that uh, you could sit anywhere within a room and enjoy a common positional experience. The other topic that we then approached was uh, what I started on at the start of the meeting and that was uh, a surround sound encode decode systems. Um, and uh, as I was saying before, there were so many non-cross compatible systems way back in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, probably 70s, 70s. And now the trend, trends these days was more and more channels. We've gone 5.1, 7.1, 9.1. These days we've got Atmos, which goes to 128 if you want channels. Um, and so if you don't get it right with five channels, you just keep adding channels. Um, we decided to combine our sweet spot technology, which meant you can sit anywhere in the room. You didn't care where the sound was, where, 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 you, where you were. And we worked on um, what we call now our involved matrix encode decode technology. Now, I know it sounds like a, a step back to the future, but we spent quite a lot of time looking at the various surround systems of the 70s. And uh, I looked at what I felt was the best, most balanced mathematics. And that came from, in my opinion, the Sansui uh, QS system it was fully circular um, in its equations. Again, if I go back to the screen share, um, where, just go forward, there we go. There, there are your basic equations. Um, and you can probably straight away recognize the, the circular nature of those equations based on those the 0.414 ratios there. Um, but essentially, you mix in um, on the left, let's say the left hand side, you um, uh, it, it mixes in different components of the of the, of the left, 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 rear, and front, 90 degree phase shifts them. But there's there's clues within the phase shift. Um, now we are sensitive to phase shift. If I if I put uh, continuous tones, you and I can easily hear phase shift. On on time varying music tones, we're less sensitive to it. And um, the matrix systems basically worked on that type of approach. Um, spent two years developing this, and we essentially updated the Sansui's uh, stuff into a free band system, which, which they did with their QD, uh, QSD1. Um, but again, the word tolerance hit them very badly. When you're doing this in analog systems, it's, um, you get enormous tolerance problems. We did this in DSP. Um, the tolerances are spot on, very complicated tri-band tri -band processing, processing. We recreated what they did, but then we then looked in terms of the psychoacoustics of it and incorporated a hell of a lot of stuff in there of how you and I hear sounds. 
I mean, uh, when you and I are comparing sounds uh, in different frequency bands, um, a, a, a 300, sorry, a, a 100 hertz tone may have a high magnitude, uh, but in reality, it's the lower, ma lower magnitude tone, say three kilohertz, that we'll hear as a dominant sound. Uh, it's those sort of things that we incorporated, which is, you know, in the Fletcher Munson uh, curve, which is there, um, where you, you incorporate in all your comparisons when you're comparing left and right channels and stuff like that, you incorporate the logarithmic nature of your hearing, you incorporate the, 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 the band structure of your hearing, how we perceive different preferences. Uh, we also incorporated three separate processes um, in the tri-band thing. And then more critically, we also looked very heavily how once you've worked out where the sound is coming from, you then have to place it. And how do you place it uh, that, that doesn't sound mechanical? And it came down to envelope shaping, that uh, sound in different bands has got different attack and decay times, um, typically speaking. So we paid a lot of attention to shaping what we were placing once you've determined where sound goes how to place it um, in a way that the ear was not going to uh, hear that and uh, the end result if any of you guys remember vector scopes there's a image of the vector scope it just happened to be a bit of music uh, and as you can see there's front left front right rear right rear left it doesn't care which, it's very circular, it's highly circular. Um, we achieve around 35 to 40 dB separation. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing here at the moment because I don't want to overlap too much on time. Uh, we then also looked at uh, ENCODE and the big failure of, I'll just go back to, I'll get off the share for a second. The big failure of the ENCODE systems of the um, uh, of the 70s was the gain. They, some like SQ were very good in terms of they sounded like stereo, but most, uh, all the other ones, they compressed the left and right from um, 20 or 30 or 40 dB down to 8 dB. And so you it, it sounded more like a, a mono in some ways. It sounded mono-ish. Um, we then conduct, we actually conducted more trials of our test monkeys and we decided to determine at what, what is the actual threshold where the average person can hear separation, that there is, um, at what point do you and I start to perceive there is an inferior sound due to crosstalk? And these days with the advent of CDs and stuff, we all used to 100 dB in the 70s and 80s and those sort of days, I think everybody was used to 20 dB was the, the aim. Uh, but I remembered there was some very good phono cartridges like the Empire, which had a 12 dB separation, it sounded very good. Uh, on our test monkeys, the transition point where they could actually detect the loss of separation was very surprising, 12 dB, uh, which really surprised the hell out of me. And uh, we uh, uh, that stimulated some thought. And we then worked on what was the Sansui's ENCODE matrix. And we changed the matrix equations a little bit, such that, um, again, on a time varying basis, we then created a a tr the first tri-band variable parameter QS matrix um, where uh, we would listen to the quantity of surround sound in there and vary the equations based on, if, if there was no surround sound, there was no surrounds happening, uh, why are bothering with surround? Default it to a more stereo bunch of equations. If there's surround happening, uh, you, you optimize the matrix more to the full uh, 0.414 ratio thing you saw in the equation. Uh, but this is happening all very fast on in tri-bands and time varying and, and whatever. And the guts of it 
is that uh, I'll show you these two plots. Um, we're nearly done, Graeme, so we're just about on time. Um, I waffled a bit too not much up front. Uh, here we go. Worst case, this is on continuous tones. Um, we would default um, from left rear to left front. So left rear to left front. Uh, that's, uh, that's a side to 12 dB separation in that one direction. Um, and, but remember, this is continuous sine wave tone. And ditto uh, right rear to right front. You would lose separation. And in all the other directions, still pretty good. 28, 38, 23. Fair amount of separation. But on time varying signals, uh, in other words, music, you get a very different presentation. It becomes 37, 34, 37, 40 odd dB here, separation. Um, and that's for non fixed tone, as I was saying. We then got test monkeys. They're going to panel of 11, I think. Yes, 11 there. And we then got the same recording, which for memory was Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Um, and we gave that test group um, the presentation in discrete 5.1, I think it was Dolby Surround. Um, and then we compared it to our encode decode approach, matrix encode decode approach, where the five channels were, uh, sorry, the four channels were recorded into two channels, stereo, which by the way, sounds exactly like stereo now. It doesn't sound, there's no compression in the sound uh, at all, it's discernible. And then we decoded it back out to five channels. And the results from the test monkeys were, uh, as you can see there, hopefully, involve, which is our system, five preferred involve. Four had no preference, two preferred discrete. We've subsequently done a fair few similar trials, and it's always a very similar ratio where the bulk, the bulk of people actually prefer the sound of involve encode decode uh, compared to discrete. Now, there are reasons for that. I'm happy to discuss what they, what they are, but they're real. Um, and so uh, I believe we have a system. It's been now reviewed on a surround forum called Quadraphonic Quad. Um, just one second. Uh, did I, did, were you guys getting that shared screen there or did I not? Um, oh, I'm sorry about that. I stuffed up. I'll just get it, uh, go back to the shared screen. Sorry about that, chaps. I really was being dumb there. This is the table uh, where on continuous tone, and as you can see, we're getting um, worst case 12 dB separation between left front and left rear and 12 between right right rear and left front. Uh, on music, it's a different picture. It's all about mid 30s, 40s, whatever it is. And there's our, our, our uh, test results on test monkeys. Um, involve, encode, decode versus discrete, 5.1 Dolby, I think. Um, involve, five preferred, involve, Four, no preference of four and um, uh, discrete preferred two. And as I said, we, we very often get the same sort of ratios. Um, so um, that's our new Y4 surround sound system. It's a bookshelf system, 10 channel, 120 watts per channel, class D, eight electrostatic transformers inside that little box. Um, it's not that little. Uh, it's got full involved encode decode. Uh, here we have a picture of our new panel in there. As you can see, it's five millimeters thick. And that's a, a look what those panels look like. And um, yeah, that's a summary of where we're going. Uh, and I'm now about to make bigger speakers. So we've gone from big, huge to, um, to uh, uh, now going back on the path towards um, uh, but we've gone small, now we're going big again, where we're going to employ uh, some of the advantages that we've managed to find out through um, uh, improving our sensitivity. We can now play with dispersion. 
how we want it. As I said, for the Y4 system there, which uses our sweet spot technology, we deliberately use highly beaming speakers. But if it's a, a speaker that's not using the sweet spot technology approach, like two desktops, we'll be using wide dispersion electrostatics. Uh, and that's where we're developing right now. And I'll throw, throw back to uh, Peter and everybody uh, for questions or whatever. Well, um, it's Graham here. Um, I want to thank you for uh, a whole lot of new stuff. Uh, yeah. One of our members on the screen at the moment is involved in setting up stereo vinyl production, and he's probably interested in this uh, technology. Um, we had a question come up. Uh, somebody was asking what was the makeup of the panel for auditioning speakers? Were they uh, seasoned listeners, experienced listeners, novices? Uh, I'll say, I'll, I'll say the, answer, the answer is yes. To all of those? To all of those. We had um, a real mix um, of the, um, mostly my panel's controllability point, uh, uh, point of view. Uh, I'm looking for something right now. Um, usually I try to restrict it to about 11 or 10 people. Um, on that bunch of 11, I think five were very, very good listeners. Um, and the rest were average to, you know, as we even have a deaf, deaf person, maybe six. But typically about half were trained listeners. Uh, my my um, design colleague, David Alexandru, um, who is known in the company as The Bitch, because he used to be my bitch, but these days he's just a bitch. Um, but he's, he's got superb ears. He's 20 years younger than me, so he probably actually has got some frequent, frequency response left. Um, and uh, he's a really detailed sort of guy and... Uh, is one and a few other guys which are very good listeners. So it's a bit of a mix. That's good. And the listing environment? Um, for in each of those trials, um, there were two different uh, speaker um, home theatre type environments used. Um, okay. One, one had an, uh, an angled proper theatre sort of thing, but it had theatre chairs and carpet and whatever and a good size room and the other one also was uh, carpet but on a flat surface um but they were, they were um reason i wouldn't say great but they were reasonable rooms okay good good um what have we got min was asking uh may i ask if you have any experience in selecting the connectors to be used for the speakers and have you encountered any issues with those? I think that's referring to electrostatic. Yeah, oh. yeah, um, there absolutely is issues and it's all called voltage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, voltage, ease of use, reliability, cost, um, oh, and look good. Uh, and they're hard parameters to satisfy. Um, and, and PCB mount because our, our our um, stators are printed circuit boards, um, uh, fiberglass. Um, they have very tight tolerance devices, fiberglass boards. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, gap separation is critical. Uh, flashovers are critical. Um, cost is critical. Also the wire, the cabling going to it. Um, Capacitance is a major issue, as is its uh, voltage um, tolerance. So, the, the, you've got to be able to withstand four, uh, three of, well, in our case, a bit over 3,000 volts uh, separation for our current systems, but up to 5,000. Um, uh, yeah, we haven't gone down the path of uh, direct drive using valves, mainly on the basis of um, creepage and clearance. Um, an absolute misery to comply to uh, to uh, any sort of safety regs with, at uh, at three or four kilovolts. The other half of that question was: Can you share the criteria for selecting connectors? Um, I, 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 just, I just did. <laughs> uh, looks, cost, 
uh, reliability, um, and voltage flashover. And the current connectors we, we buy, we, we modify. We actually extract pins um, to increase the, um, the, um, the voltage separation. Good, thank you. Yeah. Rod Staples asked, what source material did you use? Some Bloomline recordings using bipolar microphones in code well, while spaced microphones, RCA recording of Benny Goodman yeah. playing um, Weber's clarinet concert do not encode well. It's a bit of a free ad, I think. We, we've used all sorts of uh, test material. I'm, I'm personally a rockabilly punk swing kind of guy. <laughs> Uh, and and swamp music, uh, so I'm, I'm a real cultural. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, interestingly enough, I'm, I think in, in my discussions, I mentioned that we did a presentation with Technicolor in their theatre, which used to be the Disney Theatre in um, California. It's quite an interesting theatre. We have a major system in there as a trial uh, before they went broke. Uh, they had major financial problems, and um, uh, but they did um, they did an ambisonics recording using um, a tetrahedral microphone arrangement, um, which we decoded, uh, and it was extraordinary in there. Um, you were in a real three D environment, stuff on top of you sideways. Interesting, it was. Uh, ambiosonics is good, however, it does lack specific. Uh, the imaging tends to be fuzzy, and that's one of the things I didn't like. But um, it was very impressive what was achieved that that day um, uh, using ambiosonics. But we do decode ambiosonics fairly well, and that's the other thing about involved decode. It's pretty well universal, with the exception of SQ. It decodes everybody. Um, uh, with the exception of SQ, where we do a separate decode for that. Um, that includes Dolby. We, we, we decode Dolby better than they do. God, I'm arrogant, but it's true. Um, so, uh, yeah. Not again, <laughs> Ray could be listening. Oh, he won't be listening because I think he's dead. <laughs> he still could be listening. He still could be listening, but he was a, a top designer and a very... Um, I admire him, but I don't admire his company as much. We won't go into that. Um, no. Okay, now what else have we got here? Oh, there was a question about uh, safety and three and a half kV in the home. Sure. I think the um, electric cars are getting up to that sort of voltage range now. now uh, yeah. no, I think the electric cars are probably more like seven or eight hundred. I think. I'm not yeah, sure. six and six hundred to a thousand at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they'll blow you through the back wall, won't it? Um, th there's two answers to that question. One is the polarization voltage. Uh, that's not going to hurt you that much. That gives you, that just goes straight to the swear center of the brain. Um, and you know, the big F word gets mentioned every time you, you touch it, but it does, it, it's, it, it's not, uh, it's, it's high impedance. It's got 300 mega ohms up against it. So it's, it's not going to, um, cause you much tingles. Uh, what will get you is the direct drive from the uh, what's going to the um, status, uh, and that's where you're, you're cabling and the insulation has got to be very good. Uh, and it's one of the reasons we we've gone to printed circuit boards uh, for the, our stators. The um, conductive area is on the internal surface. There's just no way that gets through to the front. I can happily run this at full volume whilst holding a panel. Uh, which actually, I actually happen to have, actually happen to have a part of a panel here. It's one you prepared earlier. No, I didn't. It just happens to be on my desk. Ah, here, no, I've got both halves of it. There we go. Um, that's, um, this is the internals. And that, my friends, is mylar. From there. That's 3.5 micron mylar. This is half a panel because the, this is, been separated two halves and um, it's got the conductive gump on there had a long history of stuff on conductive gump Rob and me have tried many formulations one of the really good ones in the early days um, it was wonderful until about uh, two years down the track where it lost its conduction it just fell off a cliff gone <laughs> and no conduction after two years almost like a clock um, but we've now got 
that pretty well sold. We believe it's a nice stuff. It's very transparent. And that's the other half of it. And uh, it's printed circuit board all the way around. And the two halves join and you know, they become a, a panel. Uh, and that's, that's a prop that just happened to be there. I didn't actually bring it in tonight deliberately. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Um, Jim Barber is the first to want to ask a live question. Uh, Peter, are you able to manage that? Uh, I think I might be connected already, am I? Yes. Yep. Hi, Jim. Hi, hi Charlie. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the um, perceptual testing you are doing mm -hmm. and um, looking at the um, source material for that. I've, I've got um, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon in, in three or four or five different versions. Um, the DVD yeah. audio was the okay. most recent remix that was released on that. Um, I'm just trying to clarify exactly how you did this testing. Are you suggesting that, for example, the DVD audio 5.1 uh, you've then taken that as one of your sources for testing. You fed that into your encode decode cycle, yep. and that was a second source for the Correct. testing. Correct. And so you're, so it was really measuring a, a, a preference rather than any other characteristics. What do you mean? Sorry. So what what were you actually looking to gain? You were talking about people who preferred one or the other, or yeah, no yeah. preference. Well, first off. Um, uh, we grabbed the five, uh, uh, well, it was actually four channel because the dark side of the moon was recorded in four channel. Um, we grabbed the four channel um, discrete recording. We then encoded it into stereo, two channels, and then decoded it back to surround. So yes, we were comparing the um, uh, discrete presentation with the encode decode matrix presentation. And uh, I suppose in a perfect world, nobody can hear the difference between the two. And it turns out that that's not what we got. What we got was a slight preference towards the matrix uh, presentation. Uh, and we believe through our, through our testing and stuff, that the, there is a reason for that. And uh, you can hear it. And that is that um, as good as the recording engineers are, they can't always get every last bit of um, studio ambience and sound and people dropping shit in the studio or in whatever events that are happening. Uh, they can't deliberately always put them into the surround channels. Uh, with our approach, with the, um, the matrix approach, it actually does pick up those additional um, sounds and you do tend to get this feeling of uh, one of the things I very, very often get in um, surround sound discrete, which froze me again, uh, is you get a shitload of sound in the, in the center channel and you get ping pong, splash bang uh, in your, your surround channels, but the focus is towards the center. Um, on our system, uh, that goes, and you basically get a, a more of a dimensional surround in all areas, uh, and that's what we um, people have heard. We've got a um, at my business partner's place, place in uh, Dramana. He's got a, a major home cinema setup. We basically went to Franks and Hi-Fi, and we said, um, put in the biggest, ugliest, most expensive 7.1 system you can do. And they did that using, uh, what is it, a Meridian or Lexicon, one of those processors, 11,000 bucks worth and B&W speakers and all sorts of other stuff. Um, we put our system in parallel with that so that people can just go click, click and listen to involve encode, decode and go click instantly to um, discrete. Nobody prefers the discrete. I can tell you right now, it just doesn't happen. And uh, and so what we say, and again, I'm extremely biased and you can't trust me for a second, uh, is that uh, I believe we've got a system that sounds exactly like stereo, can be transmitted as stereo on the same bandwidth as stereo. There's no increase in bandwidth. Um, it's fully cross compatible to stereo, but yet if you've got the right decoders, sounds as good as discrete. Now on the, 
surround sound forum, uh, Quadraphonic Quad. Uh, we're all over that forum. Um, uh, it was interesting our experience on there because originally I, I, I came on fairly, fairly arrogantly claiming what we can do. And I think the general response was, you're talking shit. And um, so I did, then said, okay, pick two of your most trusted uh, people on the forum and we'll send them a involved decoder, which um, I'll go back to my screen share and show you what that looks like. The involved decoder, which is, there it is, that little square box there with the knobs and stuff on it there. Um, and we sent them a complimentary one and the reviews came back that this stuff works. And so since then we've had hundreds of reviews, literally hundreds of people who are swearing by it. And, um, and you welcome to go to that site. I can link you somehow to it. It's www.quadraphonicquad.com. And there's a tab there which links you to Involve Audio uh, and reviews as pages and pages and pages and all sorts of different topics uh, regarding it. And uh, uh, so the, the, it's been tested around the world. Um, one of the, um, the doyens of the techno music scene uh, Susan Siani last year released a the first four channel a vinyl recording using our technology also, um, uh, which I happen to have here somewhere and I don't know where I could put it. But uh, uh, so uh, we say that there are no losers with Involve Encode. That it's it's exactly like stereo. You can't pick the difference, but it does offer the advantage of having within the stereo. A non a non artifact full surround sound by artifacts I mean pumping surging clicking popping um, farty noises all sorts of stuff you might hear uh, we just don't have those problems and uh, we really don't and uh, so uh, that's our our push at the moment and uh, we're focusing ourselves in terms of our consumer product right now to get the name out there but also in parallel with uh, recording people. Uh, we offer our Involve Encode format for free. It's uh, in terms of there's no license fees. Um, we do have hardware, which you have to pay for, uh, which is which is cheap. It's like $150. Um, but uh, in America, some of our guys in America are developing a plug-in, which they're dragging their feet on, and that will be free. Uh, uh, for the recording studios, but it's, uh, it still doesn't sound right, so it's not released yet. Uh, so, but the aim is to make our involved recording format a free format for uh, home studios and everybody to use. You covered a fair bit, Charlie. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, uh, there are follow-ups, but um, I'm, I okay, Jim. It'd be good to uh, to hear this. Sure. Uh, anybody else have any questions? I've taken care of the ones that were sent in text. Anybody else? Anybody for anybody? I've sent everybody to sleep. No, they're all awake. Are they? Except that's for Edward. Good. I don't know what's happening with Edward, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, that's been an amazing trip from end to end Thanks. on the reproduction coming out of stereo. That's been excellent. But the big question now is, it's equal, easy to talk about it, but you have to hear it. Yep. So the problem we have now is, how do we do that? And I was going to uh, put the word on Charlie, mm -hmm. sometime later this year, would it be possible to um, have a bit of a listen, uh, right. subject to COVID? Uh, subject to COVID, um Anytime, basically. So, oh, great. Okay. Work out what suits you? Um, our our factory with our lousy listening room is in um, Mentone. Um, I'm happy to do it at a member's house if you want to do it at a member's place, either way. But more, absolutely happy to have you guys as a group or individually at the factory any day of the week. Well, um, we, 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 have, the week. we have offices down in South Melbourne that are quite accessible. I don't know when we're going to get back into them, but uh, yeah. that could be a possibility there. Um, sure. Yep, uh, uh, or in... Uh, happy to go either way. Um, yeah, yeah. We're good for a laugh and uh, 
come on down. Graham has been at our place. Uh, yeah. Yep. I think the list, the uh, the audience would be interested. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I hope you all got some value out of that. Uh, I certainly did, and I want to thank Charlie for taking the time and uh, sharing what is some exciting technology development in surround sound with us here in Melbourne tonight. So again, thank, thank you, guys. Much. Pleasure, and call me anytime. Uh, Graham can get you the details. It's all good. Yeah, we'll get the details out to people so they can give you a call or contact you. That'd be good. Good stuff. And thanks all for coming.